for two Olympic boxing teams as the United States takes on Canada in a final preparation for Seoul. This NBC... Welcome to the Old Coliseum in Charlotte, North Carolina, the site for the Carolinas Invitational, which includes boxing and basketball, which will be seen later on this afternoon here on NBC. Hi, everybody. I'm Marv Albert, along with the fight doctor, Ferdy Pacheco, and over the next 90 minutes, we will present the final competitive tune-up for the U.S. Olympic boxing team as they go up against the Canadian Olympic squad. And our bouts will include some of America's bright hopes. Light flyweight Michael Carbohol, the colorful featherweight Kelsey Banks, and light welterweight Todd Foster. Ferdy, where does the U.S. Olympic team stand at, at this stage, and what does today's competition mean? I think this group is coming together as a team with a possible exception of a difference of opinion of training. The Army guys feel it should be a gung-ho unit and that individuals feel they don't have to be a combat unit to compete individualistically. They're ironing that out. What this competition means is it's a necessary step to come together as a team, although fraught with the possibility of injury. A guy injured here may knock himself out of the Olympics. Right, and there has been much turmoil surrounding the U.S. Olympic boxing team last month. The original coach, Ken Adams, was suspended. So uh, at the moment, it has been a combination of Tom Coulter and U.S. Army coach Hank Johnson, who have been running the squad, and they have been at the center of the controversy. Joining us now is a man who will be joining us throughout our coverage of Olympic boxing in Seoul. He is the boxing columnist for New York's Newsday, Wally Matthews. And Wally is with Coach Tom Colton. Tom, you're the man in charge here now, but your selection wasn't exactly unanimous. You even got some criticism from one of your colleagues, Hank Johnson. Does that affect your ability to coach this team effectively? Well, the, the selection was uh, unanimous because it was a section of the United States Selection Committee, not anyone on the outside. I just moved up from assistant to head coach. Uh, I can see why Hank would have uh, uh, appealed a little, but that isn't the process. And now he's in the fold and we're working together and the uh, coaching staff has really blended very well and uh, it's a real good working machine. We're happy all to be together at this point. Tom, you've been portrayed in the press and by some people as just being a little soft on discipline. Are you tough enough to coach this team? Oh, yeah. Well, you see, that there's a different type of discipline. I don't believe you have to whip people to get them in shape. And when you get to this level, international level of an Olympic-style boxing, these fellows know what they have to do to, to perform. And I think uh, you'll see tonight that they're all conditioned well and ready to go. And uh, I'm very, I have a very strict discipline plan, but I don't scream and yell. And so everybody thinks that I'm too mellow. But uh, I do things like get kids aside and talk to them. I'd rather talk one-on-one -on -one and speak to them man-to-man -man rather than chastise them in front of a group. So it's a little different method, that's all. Tom, thank you very much. All right, Wally, and we are set now for our first bout, the lightest of the Olympic weight classes, 106 pounds, light flyweight. And these are two boxers who have met before. Um, I fought this guy before. It was in 86, so um, it was a real close fight. It was tough. Um, I fought him up in Canada. I thought I won, but it was a 2-1 split, so I'm looking forward to it. As for the fight itself, I came to North Carolina to fight. I didn't come here to, you know, fool around. Uh, I plan on fighting with a lot of aggression and a lot of heart, and I promise I won't bore you. Anybody that has a nerve to wear a hat like that can't possibly be boring. All right, set for the introductions, and here is ring announcer Don Russell. In bout number one, ladies and gentlemen, this evening, in the red corner, in the 106-pound class, from Edmonton, Alberta, Scott Olson. In the blue corner, representing the United States, from Phoenix, Arizona, Michael Carvajal. crowd reacts to Michael Carbajal, 20 years old. He's five foot five and a half, so has a four and a half inch height advantage on Scott Olson. Scott Olson, the 1988 the Canadian champion. He has competed in the 85 World Cup, the 86 World Championships, and the 87 Pan American Games. Last year in Canada, he beat Carbajal in a 2-1 decision. Carbajal says he made the mistake of standing and punching rather than boxing and weaving. And a 
review of the amateur rules. Three three-minute rounds. The scoring handled by three judges. Winner of the round receives 20 points in a close round. The loser would get 19. A clear advantage is 20 to 18 or 20 to 17. And the judges' yardstick, three blows equal one point. Three clear-cut scoring blows, not pawing. And a scoring punch uh, means a punch from the white portion of the glove. Let's make contact. Referee is Ray Silva out of Houston. And the judges, Dennis Bradley from Toronto, Augustine Zaragoza out of Mexico City, Floyd East from Lake Charles, Louisiana. That's two cautions already on the rambunctious Scott Olson, who's dying to turn pro off the Olympics. He's uh, rehearsing right now because he's fighting more pro style than Olympic style. That is to say, he is fighting instead of boxing. Carvajal keeping his cool and uh, piling up points. The object of this uh, Olympic boxing is to strike with the white of the glove and pile up the points. Carvajal very calmly trying to land two, three punches to one of the heavier punches of Scott Olsen. As you mentioned, the caution, a no-harm foul is a caution, three cautions for the same violation, a warning. And a point is taken away. When a warning is provided, that's equivalent to losing three scoring blows. Carvajal very cool here, boxing him well. Scott uh, promised not to bore, and he's certainly coming in uh, to fulfill that promise. He's trying to land something heavy to put some damage on Michael Carvajal. Responds to that combination thrown by Carvajal. Carvajal scored a lot of points. There's one, two, one, two, one, two, and uh, is that up? Oh. Olsen slept. That's what we got to look out for. Those flurries of punches that build up uh, points. Scott Olsen's style is to keep coming at you, but Carvajal doing a uh, oh, good right hand by Olsen. Carvajal was doing a good job at keeping uh, Olsen away. There's no question the difference in the uh, speed and uh, punch of Olsen. Olsen's punching with everything he's got. He's not holding back there. No tentative punches on the part of Scott Olsen. And you mentioned the pro aspirations of Olsen. Very anxious to turn professional. He's had 81 amateur fights. Right of 69 and 12. Likes to put the pressure on. Final seconds of this opening round. And this is round two. Michael Carbajal of the United States in the blue. And Scott Olson of Canada in the red trunks. And our NBC Sports uh, counterpunch giving a decisive edge to uh, Carbajal. 123 to 56 in terms of punches thrown, but Olsen uh, more proficient. I thought that was a good example of uh, Olympic boxing, the kind of thing you got to win. Carvajal was getting out of the way of the big punches and uh, not failing to land two or three counter punches as he went away. And that's the kind of stuff that uh, builds up round after round. Olsen making a sort of uh, determined gamble to try to get Carvajal out of here instead of just build up the points. A conscious effort that uh, or decision that a boxer has got to make. Michael Carvajal began boxing seven years ago at age 13. He made the Olympic team by winning by a decision over James Harris at the trials in Las Vegas. He has had extensive international experience, but very impressive. Considered one of the United States' bright hopes in terms of winning a medal in Seoul. I definitely think he's one of the brightest prospects we have. I, I like the coolness and the ability to throw punches from all angles and keep moving. I mean, he throws them in retreat, he throws them coming in. Fine amateur fighter. And the Scott Olson from Canada we have to characterize as a tough nut. Here's a guy that really comes to fight. minute remaining in this second round. One of the things we have to observe over watching these series of fights is the difference that a referee can make. 
Here's a very quiet referee. He's barely been in this contest. I suppose the some we saw who dominated the contest. Carvajal getting the jab in. Those are scoring points. And then connects with the right hand. Referee is Ray Silva out of Houston. The counter by Scott Olson that scored. Olson of Canada in the red. Carvajal of the United States in the blue. Olson must have quite a bit of confidence in his punch because he was satisfied to land three punching punches, but he got hit about six or seven in return. He must feel that they um, will wear out Carvajal in the, in the last round. And we are final seconds. Second round. Final round, Marv Albert with the fight doctor, Ferdy Pacheco from the old Coliseum, Charlotte, North Carolina, United States against Canada. Final tune-up for both the Olympic and American squads. And uh, <laughs> a little takedown on the part of uh, Michael Carvajal and Scott Olson. I don't know how he's going to do in the Olympics, uh, young Scott Olson, but he's going to do pretty well in the pros. He's got a lot of salt and pepper. He is feisty. Reminiscent of uh, Ed Hobson, who we saw at the uh, trials, uh, very energetic, non-stop action. Actually, even for this class, it's a small fight, but it's compact and very, very well built. I gave that last round to uh, Carvajal again, making it uh, two for Carvajal, nothing for Scott Olson, who's been gambling that he can put away. Michael Carvajal, so far his gamble has not paid off. And the NBC Sports Counterpunch uh, had Carvajal in that second round throwing more punches. 97, landing 16. You know, it's not just the punches, it's the, uh, the ring generalship. It's the way that the bout is conducted. And in this bout, uh, the aggressor has been Scott Olson, no question about it, but the ring generalship of Carvajal has uh, uh, been able to dominate the way uh, the fight goes. He's been fighting very well, counter-punching, ring generalship, defense. Halfway through this third and final round. competition in the Olympics is going to be fierce in this division because the Asian countries produce great small fighters as do the South American country. So Carvajal's got a big job ahead of him in the Olympics. This at 106 pounds, a light flyweight, and uh, that would particularly hold true against uh, the hometowners, the South Koreans. And of course the crowd is going to be some kind of effect on the judges whether they like it or not. Better remaining in the bout. Right hand by Carvajal, who appears to be piling up the points here in this final round. Strong showing by Carvajal in this last round. Far from being worn out, he is the pressure of the two. Michael Carvajal with that four and a half inch height advantage against the busy Scott Olson as this bout comes to a conclusion. From the light flyweight division, Michael Carvajal and Scott Olson will be back with the official decision. Hall of the United States, Scott Olson of Canada are awaiting the decision and it appears that they are set. Ladies and gentlemen, by the score of two to one, your winner from the blue corner is Michael Carvajal. So the 20-year-old out of Phoenix, Arizona, Michael Carvajal, avenging that earlier loss at the hands of Scott Olson. And who knows, perhaps down the line, they'll meet again in Korea. Now let's go to Wally.
Michael Olsen had beaten you a couple of years ago. Today you reverse that decision. It's a nice way to go into Seoul, isn't it? Yeah, because, um, you know, if I, it's a, you know, it builds up your confidence, you know. If you, I was saying before the fight, I better not lose because, you know, it might, you know, take my confidence away, you know, as winning international bouts. But um, whatever way I went, I would have kept it up, though, and um, I thought I boxed real good today. So. But another thing for you to think about was the possibility of injury, and he was obviously in there to knock you out. He was throwing some hard punches. Was there any point where you considered maybe playing it safe so that you wouldn't get injured before the Olympics? Um, no, I didn't have any concern until they started asking me questions about it, but um, I knew I wasn't going to think of that anyway, so that's why I stood up and kept on fighting. He landed one good right hand on you there in the first round. Were you hurt at all? No, he never hurt me at all. Um, the last time we fought, he didn't either, so I already knew that uh, this guy couldn't hurt me. He punches hard, but uh, I already knew that you know I could take a good punch too. So. Okay, and now back to Marv. And we'll be back with the 112-pound flyweight division in just a moment. Carolina, this part of the uh, Carolina's Invitational this weekend, which also includes basketball, gymnastics, and cycling. And uh, we're set for our second uh, bout of the day, the flyweight division, 112 pounds. Let's go to the ring announcer, Don Russell. Ladies and gentlemen, our second bout of the evening in the 112-pound division. First in the red corner from Verdun, Quebec, Corey Burton. And in the blue corner, from Minneapolis, Minnesota, Arthur Johnson. Your referee is Dennis Bradley. So, Arthur Johnson, who began boxing in 1979 at the age of 12, and a young man who's made it back from hand surgery going up against the southpaw, Corey Burton. And Johnson with a three-inch uh, height advantage. Burton's 19-year-old, won the 1986 Quebec Cup, the 87 Canadian Games, and the 1988 Canadian Championships. Corey Burton lost to Arthur Johnson in the 87 Pan Am game, stopped in the second round, caught by a right hand. Johnson certainly uh, fighting with a cool amount of disdain. It doesn't look like he, he's just here to see what the other guy's got before he opens up. And he's losing uh, a lot of points here as Corey Burton keeps on punching and building up those points. I'll tell you one thing, if the lights go out, we won't have any trouble finding Corey Burton. He's got some, some fluorescent shoes on. Caution for a holding with a minute gone by in this uh, first round. And as we see right at the start, referee Dennis Bradley out of Toronto, a bit more uh, aggressive than we saw in that uh, first bout. Ray Silva taking a low key approach. Arthur Johnson better start getting his mind on this bout because. Uh, Corey Burton has come to win this first round. He is uh, out punching him, out scoring Arthur Johnson, who seems content to uh, paint pictures out there. He's just out there looking at him. Maybe he's low by the fight that he thinks he can knock him out. And uh, certainly wasting away this first round. blows that were not scoring punches again Dennis Bradley in with a caution he's going to be much more active than Silva was in the last bout and we have a half minute remaining in this opening round Johnson still does not have the range. Corey Burton dancing just out of range. He's got to step in with a punch to get him close. And he did get the left hand in. And then uh, takes a uh, caution for using his shoulder to push off Burton. Stop. And uh, that stoppage to uh, rearrange the 
the shirt of uh, Corey Burton. Or as they say, the best. An aesthetic consideration by Dennis Bradley. According to our count of punch stats, Arthur Johnson had a very effective first round, landing 90 punches, connecting with 34. That's uh, just under 40 percent of punches landed, as compared to uh, Burton, who was uh, 58 punches thrown and the uh, 13 connected. Well, I must, my computer must be going wrong because I think Corey Burton won that first round off uh, uh, much uh, better defense and much more punching. And uh, but. Arthur Johnson setting him up for the heavier punching, which started this round off with effective and hard punching. He seems to have closed that gap that was developing between Corey Burton and Johnson, so Johnson couldn't land effectively. Well, he opened this up in fine fashion. He has had enormous international experience. Selected as the outstanding boxer at the 1986 Goodwill Games, winning the flyweight division. And at the uh, Pan Am Games in 87, he did stop uh, Corey Burton, as we mentioned, in the second round. But then in the final, he lost a decision to the Cuban opponent. Well, he's on the way to inflicting a stoppage, at least, of uh, Corey Burton here, because he's landed some very hard blows that have buckled Corey Burton. Knockdowns in one round of four in the bout, and the match is over, and that includes a standing eight. Dennis Bradley ready to step in at the slight. He almost stepped in. A good hook landed. There's no question about it. Corey Burton thoroughly outclassed right here. And Johnson going for the stop. Going for the night. Yeah, he has really picked the pace up here in the second round. Hank Johnson, assistant United States coach, and head, uh, Army coach, and he certainly has to uh, like what he has been seeing out of Arthur Johnson here today, who is just pounding away at Corey Burton. His punches are sharp, and they're landing right on the button, doing some damage to Corey Burton, who's trying to fight back, with, trying to fight back, but is getting overwhelmed. See how solidly the shots land and the effect on Curry. That was well done. And our counterpunch uh, statistics show a very solid round for Arthur Johnson. This is round three. Johnson of the United States in the blue and Curry Burton of Canada in the red. Well, after a tentative first round where Arthur seemed to know something we didn't know, he just opened up with the goods on the second round, said this is the real Arthur Johnson and has dominated Corey Burton. Arthur Johnson, 22 years old, from right. East St. Louis, and boxing back in 1979 at the age of 12. He's in superb shape. In fact, he ran cross-country in high school and has made it back successfully from hand surgery. Well, it's a kind of good condition that you have to have after absorbing a second round beating like he did to come back out here and fight the third round with uh, a little bit of steam that he's got. You got to give him credit. Johnson going back to being a little lazy right now. Coming up 
about a minute and a half remaining in the bout. Johnson lands, you can see the effect on uh, Corey Burton. He could have sworn that tattoo was around the front of his shoulder and just turned it right around. He is punching hard as Arthur Johnson. And the referee Dennis Bradley just uh, requested that uh, the cornerman, Corey Burton, keep it quiet. Coaches cannot uh, talk to the boxers. Actually, he said they were praying at the time. Round three, and they're hoping this goes all the way to the end because Arthur Johnson's coming on stronger and stronger. Although he's a little bit lazier than he was in that second round when he was so effective. Responding to the exchange, which concluded with the nice combination by Johnson. Fast retreat by Corey Burton when he realized he was getting outpointed there, getting hit two to one, and the punches were hurting. And a headbutt portion. Corey Burton and Arthur Johnson finishing strong. Got to give Corey Burton credit for having guts, but uh, not much brain standing right in front of the cannon that is Arthur Johnson is not to his uh, benefit. And we'll be back with the decision after these words from your local state. Back in Charlotte, North Carolina, as we take a look at the NBC Sports uh, Count of Punch, uh, no question about this one as we await the decision. Looks to be all Arthur Johnson. And now let us get the official word. Ladies and gentlemen, in a unanimous decision, in the 112-pound division, your winner in the blue corner is Arthur Johnson. So, Arthur Johnson out of East St. Louis with the unanimous decision over the Canadian Corey Burton. Arthur will join Wally Matthews. Arthur, you knocked Burton out uh, last year. Today you beat him pretty easily. You seem to pretty much have his number, huh? Yeah, um, you know, I've been working with a lot of left-handers. Michael Collins, down to Jim, and Tim Austin, the one six. So I was, uh, you know, pretty ready. I was uh, very ready. You know, I just like to thank and praise God for it. You know, giving me the strength, you know, to come out here and do the best that I can. And, uh, and I did the best that I could, I thought. Now, you seem to have him on the verge of being knocked out again in the second round today, and then it looked as if you got a little bit tired. Do you need to work on some more conditioning in the five weeks before the Olympics? Well, I think this was just a tuna fight. You know, that's all it was taken for. But I took the fight serious, and uh, it was just a tuna fight. And uh, hopefully, you know, toward the uh, Olympics now, I'm starting to reach my peak, and I'm starting to look like the old Arthur Johnson did back in 1985. And uh, if I continue with that, then uh, I feel I won a gold medal over in Seoul. Arthur, thanks very much, and now back to Mark. All right, Wally, and we are now set for the featherweight uh, division, 125 pounds. The boxers are in the ring, and here are the introductions. In the 125-pound division, first in the red corner, from St. Catharines, Ontario, Jamie Packendam. And in the blue corner, from Chicago, Illinois, Kelsey Banks. 23 year old Kelsey Banks out of Chicago, now living in Houston, he is a southpaw making it back from a right shoulder injury going up against Jamie Pagadam. And back in 1985 at the Australian Games, Pagadam was knocked out by Kelsey Banks. Kelsey, though, has had his ups and downs in recent months. Some injury problems in particular uh, to the right shoulder. Earlier this year, lost the Nationals to uh, high schooler Carl Daniels. This after taking Boxing of the Year honors in 1987. And he comes off that uh, controversial decision uh, to make it to the 
the U.S. Olympic team by virtue of the victory of the popular Ed Hobson in Las Vegas. And Chelsea had to do it the hard way, winning two days in a row and uh, doing it at the Olympic box office. Both of us were there and watched it, and I, we were divided. Some people thought that Hobson won, and some people thought that Kelsey won. Probably for the U.S. Olympic team, it's much better than Kelsey Banks uh, won in view of his experience. And he is a fantastic fighter once he gets himself in shape and uh, motivated. Apparently, he is tonight. He's come out uh, very, very uh, forceful and dedicated. Jamie Pagadam won the Canadian Championships in 1986 and also this year said it would be a good boxer good lateral movement not a strong puncher though took a year off from boxing he says uh, he felt he was burning out and once again the american boxer has a decisive uh, height advantage we have seen that in the previous bouts uh, magadam at five six and a half banks all for a featherweight at six feet. I don't think you'll find many featherweights that are going to come close to him uh, in, in height. That also gives him a tremendous reach advantage, which Kelsey Banks, when he is fighting his fight, uh, uses very well at his advantage. He is a superior fighter, very slick. Banks tries to use his reach, stays outside, but the problem in recent months hasn't been using the jab enough. And there's a caution for holding behind the head by uh, referee Floyd East. The caution in the direction of both Banks and Pagadam. Right now, Kelsey Banks dictating uh, the tempo of the fight and uh, landing the more effective and numerous bl uh, blows, as was expected off of a first round of a fighter that fights with the smoothness and speed of Kelsey Banks. Final seconds, first round. You guys just taking a play with me. You lost that round, I'm going to tell you. So you got to start coming back. Now let's go. Like I said, camp. get your points. In and out, in and out, in and out. One thing you're not doing, which is real good, is you're not going back to the ropes in the corner. Right. Stay out there, box, but throw some punch. You got to throw some blows. Get up. 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 Get Kelsey Banks told in his corner by Coach Tom Coulter that he, he lost the round. Our counterpunch stats uh, on the even side. In fact, they show Banks uh, connected more frequently than Pagadam, and Banks uh, came out strong, but then uh, took a pretty good shot from Pagadam. They're fighting now. They abandoned boxing. Boxing was that first round, which I thought Kelsey took by a very narrow margin. He had our counterpunch showed he had punch uh, connected more, but very even. I thought he, he dominated, uh, not dominated, but he, he slid by with a superior boxing skill. Right now, they're just fighting. Oh, and Banks put down by Pagadan. And the Kelsey-Banks puzzle continues. Pagadan was punching with everything he had. And when I said they're going to fighting, this is what I'm talking about. There's a, a caution against Pagadan for for Buddy. Well, he's, he's very excited. He wants to make sure that he, he can put away Kelsey. And it goes to hurt him again. And this is not considered to be uh, one of the stronger Olympic teams. The squad from uh, Canada for the United States uh, thought to be a, a tune-up. The United States has taken the first two matches, but here is Kelsey Banks put to the canvas in round two as we come up on the halfway mark of the second round. A little bit of desperation in the fighting of Kelsey Banks. I think he's embarrassed by that knockdown. Agadam continuing to make it a barroom brawl here. He just wants to wing away. And pretty what makes it uh, rougher for uh, Banks to accept is that Agadam is not considered to be a strong puncher. But here comes Banks right back, and he hurt Agadam. He hurt him. If he attacks now, he can get a standing eight. referee 
referee is not as merciful and uh, apparently wants to see a lot more damage before he gives him a standing eight. And of USA from this crowd here in Charlotte, North Carolina, Marv Albert in the fight doctor, Bertie Pacheco. It is the U.S. against Canada, final tune-up for both before they take some uh, rest time and get back to training and head to Seoul. Remember, a, a knockdown or a, a standing eight counts no more than a punch, a good punch uh, by the white of the glove. So it's not like professional boxing where you've lost a round where you went down. He's made a good recovery as Kelsey Banks, and they've been going at it pretty evenly since the knockdown. Be interesting to see what the judges have this round. So that will do it for the second round, a round that saw Kelsey Banks knocked down by Jamie Pagadan. See what a knockdown looks like in Olympic boxing. Kelsey caught completely, clipped right on the chin. His legs go out from under a resounding knockdown. But he got up and fought later and got um, Pagadan in trouble. Although the referee did not feel merciful enough to stop it and give him a standing eight, but it was uh, indicative of the power that Kelsey Banks has to come back. And if you are counting punches, Kelsey Banks, three minutes, Jamie, three minutes. The better round of uh, Jamie Pagadan by a decisive margin. Yeah. I mean, that's what makes Olympic scoring so interesting when you're sitting home just watching a fight fight. It's one thing. This is Olympic boxing, and there are certain specific rules. The number of punches landed, folks, is what wins the fight, and, and uh, Kelsey Banks landed more punches even though he went down in the second round. It would appear that Banks won that second round. I think we're looking at an even fight uh, going into this uh, third and final round. In the red from Canada, Jamie Pagadam, 22 years old, out of St. Catharines, Ontario, Canada. He's been fighting 12 years, so he is, in effect, a veteran amateur. He is the Canadian champion from uh, this year and back in 1986 while Kelsey Banks, a man who never saw a microphone he did not like. Uh, no shortage of conversation around Kelsey, but uh, trying to prove that he is back on the right track. However, off that knockdown of the second round, there will be doubts going into the Olympic competition. Well, also, a man, Kelsey, told us in uh, interviews yesterday, he said, well, I don't take these things that seriously. I, fought, I fight as hard as I have to. I'm saving myself base oh, well. Oh. <laughs> he, he got himself a little uh, lesson in boxing. You either go 100% of the time or you pay the price. And now he's fighting 110 just to win this fight because, like you, I have it an even fight. Agadam with a scoring right hand, minute and a half to go in this final round. Kelsey Banks took Boxing of the Year honors back in 1987. 86, one of three Americans to win a world championship. against the Canadian uh, Fangadan pushing off. The American coaches yelling, he's knocked out, go take him out. He doesn't look very knocked out to me. He's still there, although he's weary. And I have Kelsey Banks this far. Winning this round does from the sheer multitude of punches. He's just raining punches on Jamie. Pagadam comes up with a shot that just straightens up Kelsey Banks, like saying, whoa, what was that? And the caution against Pagadam for using his shoulder. And we are coming to the end of the bout. Kelsey Banks was put down by Jamie Pagadam back in the uh, second round, but Banks came back strong, also landed after the bell. And uh, Pagadam is celebrating, but uh, we will 
find out. We'll get that final, the official decision in just a moment. At North Carolina, and you can see uh, the counterpunch folks have it as basically an even third round. But if you go by these stats, uh, it should be a victory for Kelsey Banks, despite the fact that he was put down in the second round. Here is uh, the official decision. Ladies and gentlemen, in the 125-pound division, your winner, by a score of 2-1, to one, in the blue corner, Kelsey Banks. Well, mixed reaction, despite the fact that uh, most people here in Charlotte are rooting for the United States Olympic team, but they're looking at it objectively, and uh, without the benefit of counting punches, uh, they felt that the Paganan, particularly with the knockdown, should have won the fight. Well, I think counter boo shows it wasn't. <laughs> It was definitely an overwhelming boo on the part of Kelsey Banks, who continues his strange career alienating the public, bragging and not fulfilling his bragging, and somehow eking out a victory. All right, Kelsey Banks will uh, have the opportunity to do some more bragging here, perhaps, as we go to Wally and Kelsey. Kelsey, for a while now, a lot of people have been saying it's not the same Kelsey Banks. Maybe he's reached his peak. Today you won, but the crowd booed. You got knocked down. What's going on? That's up. But no, it, it was a tough fight. I expected it to be tough. Uh, I think I was too much of a lax, relaxed frame of mind. You know, uh, to me the fight didn't mean anything. Uh, Turn up like a gym workout. You uh, know, you know the points I got caught with, I got careless. He called me clean. You know, but it was nothing real big to me. It didn't, you know, it didn't really hurt me. It didn't knock me off balance and drop me. You know? Were you hurt at all? Oh no, no. He uh, he stunned me a couple times, and not really hurt me. Where you know, oh man, what I'm gonna do? You know, he come with a couple of good shots, you know, and uh, when I fight with the southpaws, I expect to get it more because we both are throwing the same punch, the same combinations. So it's a matter of who's blocking and who's doing more thinking. And he called me, and I expect to get caught. Kelsey, thanks very much. Mm -hmm. And now back to Marv. Thanks, Wally. And when we return, it'll be the 139 pounders featuring American Todd Foster out of Great Falls, Montana. Albert, along with the fight doctor, Ferdy Pacheco from the Old Coliseum, Charlotte, North Carolina, as our coverage continues. And this is 20-year-old Todd Foster out of Missoula, Montana, now living in Great Falls, Montana, getting set to go against uh, Mark Blanchett. There are those in amateur boxing who contend that Foster's pro-like style could hurt him come Olympic time. We asked Todd if that concerns him. And not at all. You know, if I can get away with roughing up the guy, I'll rough him up. But, uh, but if I can't, you know, I can, I can fight clean. All right, we'll uh, check it out here today against uh, Mark Blanchett. We're set for the uh, introductions. Let's go to Don Russell. In the 139-pound division, in the red corner, from Montreal, Quebec, Mark Blanchett. And in the blue corner, from Great Falls, Montana, Todd Buster. Your referee is Bill Trickle. Bill Fridlin out of Toronto, the referee, the three judges, Ray Silva from Houston, Augustine Zaragoza out of Mexico City, and Dennis Bradley from Toronto. Mark Blanchett subbing for Howard Grant sitting out because of, get this, Ferdy, superstition. He has <laughs> lost only twice in his career, but both defeats took place in the month of August. So he's sitting it out, and Mark Blanchett is filling in for Howard Grant. We once, uh, we once worked with Willie Pastrano, who wouldn't fight Jose Torres because his astrologer told him it wasn't a good month. When he finally told him it was a good month, he almost got killed in the ring and lost his title. Fired his astrologer, by the way. Oh. I was waiting for the punchline. <laughs> the interesting thing with Todd Foster, who uh, has been over and over again uh, compared to a professional stylist trained by uh, Lou Duba and Kenny Weldon, who are both ringside, and he went over and got a last-minute instructions from them before he came in here just a few minutes ago. Todd Foster has been developing his upper body strength, and he does go for the uh, knockout punch. Says he knows very little of his opponent, Mark Blanchett and the Red Trunks. So he will uh, feel things out in the uh, first round. He felt it out pretty good as he puts Blanchett down. That was three punches in a row while he was falling. I mean, he doesn't wear socks. There's more than a resemblance to Tyson in that. And let's say it is, it is all over. That is an RS 
see the referee stop the contest. Bill Cridlin out of Toronto felt that that was enough for Mark Blanchett. And so Todd Foster with a first round RSC, as they say in the amateur round. Well, this youngster uh, certainly has strength in his punches. Let's let's watch the knockdown. After the punch, it hurts him. Right there, watch two more punches as he's going down. There's another one and another one. I mean, that's enough to throw two or three towels in. That's enough for that. So it is a quickie for Todd Foster, who is alongside Wally Matthews. Well, Todd, obviously, you're not saving yourself for the Olympics. You went right out after your opponent. You were aware that he was a substitute. Did that sort of influence you to go for an early knockout? Well, first of all, I'd like to say hi to my fiance, Jillian, my parents. Happy anniversary to him. Tomorrow's their 23rd. And, uh, no, I didn't take him lightly because even though he was a substitute, he's one of their top guys. So I knew I had to just, I wanted to take my time, set everything up, and I was setting him up to the body. And it was open when I come back, come with the overhand right to the head. Yeah. It seemed that you set him up as right, and then you threw an overhand right to the head. Did you then land a left hook, if I remember correctly? Yeah, I hit him with the left hook on the chin after the right hand. He was out already, but I wanted to finish him off. And I hit him with another right, but I hit him in the chest. Todd, considering the danger that's always involved in fighting, could you have gotten more out of the gym workout today than this? No, I don't think so. You need to get in the, the ring. Um, I, don't, I think it was a good fight. It boosts my confidence now. I'm ready to uh, go to the Olympics and uh, win a gold medal. Todd, thanks a lot. And now back to Marv. All right, Wally, the pride of Great Falls, Montana. Todd Foster stopping Mark Blanchett and RSC in round number one. We'll be back here in Charlotte. After the Marv Albert, along with the fight doctor, Ferdy Pacheco from the Old Coliseum, Charlotte, North Carolina, as our coverage continues. The United States Olympic team going up against the Canadian Olympic team, and we are set now for the light heavyweight division at 178 pounds. In the 178-pound division, in the red corner, from Calgary, Alberta, Brent Kosolowski. And in the blue corner, representing the United States Army, from Fort Carson, Colorado, Andrew Maynard. Your referee is Ray Silva. Andrew Maynard, who is nursing a tender knuckle on his right hand, he says he will be jabbing more. Hey, come on, do your thing, man. Boy, all your back smack, back smack, a little lots of hair. Come on. From Canada, Brent Coco Kosolovsky. And I should point out, Ferdy, that's uh, Coco short for hot chocolate, a nickname that he uh, picked up while playing basketball in his younger days. Kosolovsky, 23 years old, be 24 in two weeks out of Calgary, Alberta, Canada. He is a fitness instructor. Boxes for the National Amateur Boxing Club, won the 88 Canada Cup and the 86 Canadian Championships. He certainly built like a physical instructor. You could put a grand piano on those legs. They're uh, really stout legs. Hardy looking individual is Hot Chocolate or Coco. And he is a, a strong puncher. He's had extensive international experience. Being trained by Mansour Ismail. And a trained uh, Willie DeWitt. But uh, Andrew Maynard now on target with scoring punches. Those are a series of good combinations by Maynard, landing flush, building up those points, and then going to end, ending up with hard body shots. And back comes Coco. Andrew Maynard made the United States Olympic team by taking a decision over Alfred Cole at the Olympic box off last month. This after losing to Cole on points, so he had to do it at the uh, box off the following day. Way through this first round. Maynard of the United States in the blue. Kozlowski of Canada in the red. Maynard working hard to take this, this first round. Push down and Silva again. That's a caution for pushing the opponent's uh, head down. Notice that the uh, clock 
And that is the official clock on the screen. We want to deal with official matters here, uh, 30. Uh, and the clock did stop with that caution. Coco pulling his head down should draw another caution. And it uh, does. A third caution for that same violation would be a warning. <laughs> he just did it again. And that would mean uh, losing a point. doing a pretty good job of uh, outspeeding and outslicking uh, the stronger looking Coco and might be making a mistake to stand toe to toe with him for no reason at all I think he just got clipped right then did uh, Maynard he doesn't need to do that coming up on 10 seconds left in this first round That is it for round one. And as Brent Coco Kozlowski comes out of his corner for round two, Andrew Maynard taking his time coming out. And Maynard had the edge according to our NBC Sports uh, counterpunch, handled by a couple of uh, operators, Logan Hobson, Bob Canobio, who are keying in on each boxer, tracking uh, punches thrown and connected. No credit, incidentally, is given for pawing. It has to be a legitimate scoring punch with the white portion of the glove. Or blocking with your body. Right now, Kozlowski is just trying to out-bull Maynard. Maynard getting those point-building uh, punches in there. Why Maynard has... Oh, good shot by Maynard. Wrong left hand by Andrew Maynard that uh, stunned Kozlowski. Maynard, for some unknown reason is going for a knockout here when he was outpointing uh, Kozlowski easily by outboxing him. So much for nursing that tender knuckle on his <laughs> on his right hand. He had told us yesterday he would be jabbing more to protect it. Andrew Maynard, another of that uh, four-man army contingent on the uh, U.S. Olympic team. Andrew says his hobbies are cooking, basketball, and puzzles. Similar interests uh, to that of the fight doctor. And at yes. the moment, uh, Andrew made it solving the puzzle of Brent Kozlowski. Kozlowski is not punching with um, great authority, but uh, Maynard is getting tired here. He's been winging everything these two uh, rounds, and he's gotten weary. I mean, his legs look weary. Kozlowski's just a bull. He seems tough. Cut from that George Chavalo timber. And you're looking at Army coach Hank Johnson. He is the older brother of champion Marvin, or former champion Marvin Johnson. Boy, this is called Don't Hold Anything Back. I mean, they're fighting like this is the third round in the Olympics for the gold medal. They're going at it. Ooh. Low blow by Maynard. with that strong right hand. Kozlowski doesn't look like all of those punches are doing any damage, and Maynard looks like he's wearing out. He's the one inflicting the uh, punching, and yet the effect is on Maynard. It's like a backfire in his face. He's getting tired. Second round is uh, coming to a close. Well, if you would check out the uh, NBC Sports counterpunch, uh, you see that made it with the slight edge in terms of punches thrown and connected. This is the third and final round, and they come out winging. And interestingly enough, Maynard didn't follow orders uh, like they teach in the Army. He said, don't get wide, said uh, Coach Johnson. Keep it in tight. Keep your gloves in tight. Now, remember, caution for a headbutt. Uh, in, a, in a realm of cautions now, 
um, Kozlowski has two cautions about pushing down on the head. They carry over into the next rounds. If he gets one more, he gets a point taken away. Uh, it's not as if he's excused at the end of the bell. Three cautions for the same violation constitutes a, a warning and the loss of a point, which uh, can certainly be damaging. Winner of a round receiving 20 points and a close round, the loser gets 19. Clear advantage would be a 2018 or 2017. Kozlowski scoring well as Maynard refuses to get in tight, keeps his arms out wide and, and gives an avenue for Kozlowski to come in punching. If Kozlowski could box well enough to punch sharply and tightly inside, this could, this could turn around dramatically. But apparently, he is not that uh, gifted. Andrew Maynard in the blue, 24 years old, from Chevrolet, Maryland, now stationed at Fort Carson, Colorado. Oh, no. If you keep watching Kozlowski, you see him push down on the head of Maynard over and over again. That's a slip. Brent Coco Kozlowski, 23 years old, out of Calgary, Alberta, Canada. And as we mentioned earlier, and uh, you can see particularly during the course of that second round that he is in excellent physical shape. He is a fitness instructor in his off time. He trains to take punches because he's taking punches very well and it's Maynard who looks exhausted and sloppy right now. And we have one minute to go in this final round. And Maynard has nothing left on his punches. He's just kind of flailing away. But again, in amateur boxing, we remind you it is the number of scoring punches. That was a good example right there. Uh, uh, Maynard scored about uh, six oatmeal punches. It wouldn't punch oatmeal. a hole in oatmeal. And uh, they count a point apiece. Or as good as a winging hook. Means a uh, punch from the white portion of the gloves. Must make contact. Knuckle surface blows. Again, pushing down on the, on the uh, head of Maynard by Kozlowski. Final seconds, final round. And they finish with a flurry. And a warning. So a point has been taken away from Kozlovsky. That was the uh, third portion. As uh, this bout has come to an end. And for the decision, light heavyweights, 178 pounds, Andrew Maynard. And Brent Kozlowski. Ladies and gentlemen, in the 178-pound division, your winner by unanimous decision in the blue corner, Andrew So Andrew Maynard, one of the four Army boxers on the U.S. team, has come away with the decision as the U.S. Canada Dual Olympic Boxing Competition continues. And sometimes you get the feeling that the U.S. team has a dual personality because of two factions, those from the military ranks, those from the private sector, which has led to a difference of philosophy in training. Trying to get the civilians hooked up into the Army Discipline Program is very hard. You have a lot of, you know, civilians on the team. You know, I respect them highly. But they're so used to training by themselves. You know, we Army people are trained to, to yell and grunt and cheer each other on. You know, and then you find several fighters that's so quiet that, you know, we, we sound off, you know, say ah, or say ho, you know, or say USA number one, and they don't. They just, you know, that's the face they have all through practice, you know. Uh, I have the so-called record of being uh, the vigilante or uh, uh, the, the guy that's uh, a knight, you know, he's a, a nomad, you know, and I, I feel it's indirect, you know, my position has been indirectly misled because I do what's best for Kelsey Banks and that's, that's how I got to where I am, you know, uh, looking out for myself, I speak up for myself. Civilians really, they're having a hard time adjusting to people, telling them what to do and pushing them, you know, hard. Because uh, all the Army members, we are used to getting pushed real hard. And civilians, it's going to take some time for them, you know, just as well as this. It's taking uh, military people time to adjust to the new coaching system, you know, uh, different training methods and, and, 
you know, everything like that. So it's going to take some time, but I think we'll get there. By the time Phil comes around, we'll be, we'll be ready. And heavyweight Ray Nurser, the elder statesman of that Army Quartet, is ready for his bout against Wayne Bernard. In the 200 pound division, in the red corner, from Charlottetown, Prince Edward Canada, Wayne Bernard. And in the blue corner, representing the United States Army, stationed in Baumholder, Germany, Ray Mercer. Your referee is Dennis Bradley. Ray Mercer is the 1988 U.S. Army champion out of Jacksonville, Florida, 27 years old. He's stationed in West Germany, an infantryman of the United States Army, and going up against 22-year-old Wayne Bernard, who is inexperienced, only a second year in boxing. He's had only six amateur bouts. A one-time hockey player, played junior hockey as a goaltender. In fact, I asked him who his uh, favorite player is, and he said Ron Hextall of the Philadelphia Flyers because he keeps the slot clean. Hextall, uh, one of the more aggressive goaltenders in the uh, National Hockey League, to put it uh, diplomatically. Well, this is one of the few uh, goal hockey goaltenders I've ever seen have his own front teeth. He is uh, unmarked. And, uh, but his experience is uh, very light. He's had uh, six professional bouts and one four, lost two. So he's here kind of as ongoing gut substitute. Subbing for Tom Glesby, who suffered a broken nose during training camp at Glesby, will be headed for the Olympics. Bernard took this fight on only five days' notice. He took off from work. He is a food salesman and also took a good shot, leading to the standing eight. His legs buckled on that one. This should be merely a brief workout for Ray Mercer. Well, Mercer can't afford to get so relaxed as he was at the beginning because he's a very tough big guy. He's 200 pounds of uh, compact uh, fighter here. I don't know why he would want to get punch in a punch out with this guy. Uh, because he's so obviously superior to him in, in boxing skills, he should be boxing and honing up his skills for the Olympic. Ray Mercer made the uh, U.S. Olympic team by defeating Michael Bent at the Olympic box off last month. He's 27 years old and he came to boxing very late in his career. He's teeing off right now on Wayne Bernard and he is accepting a great deal of punishment. The scouting report on Bernard, raw but strong, takes a good punch. He has taken a standing eight here in the first round. He is what would be called a Tony Galento kind of fighter. It's the kind that you don't want to meet in, a, in an alley outside a beer hall, but leaves a little bit to be desired inside a ring. This is the heavyweight division, 201 pounds. As we come up uh, to the final seconds of this first round, and uh, an adjustment of the headgear of Wayne Bernard provided for by the referee Dennis Bradley, so the clock is stopped. We need a new headgear. Tom Coulter trying to get the attention of uh, Ray Mercer as the request for a new headgear is given team manager Ken Mapper uh, doing the repairs on Wayne Bernard. Headgear is broken, they don't have any headgear and uh, they're sort of trying to solve the dilemma. They're going back into the dressing room to see if they can get another kid's headgear, another Canadian boxer's headgear. It's doubtful if there's a Canadian with a head as big as this guy. I mean, this is a moose size head. He is tough looking uh, customer is Wayne Bernard. Charming man, he said he, he, he plays sports depending on the season. If it's snowing outside, he puts his shoes out, and goes out and plays hockey, likes all sports. And they have located the uh, headgear, Wayne Bernard subbing for Tom Glesby. Both the United States and Canadian squads have been hit by injury. Light middleweight Roy Jones, super heavyweight Riddick Bowe, bantamweight Kennedy McKinney not here. And 
uh, Lesby along with uh, light welterweight Howard Grant, middleweight uh, Egerton Marcus, and super uh, heavyweight, highly regarded Lennox Lewis, also uh, sideline. And uh, there is a caution for holding as this first round comes to a close. Well, our NBC Sports counterpunch uh, showing a decisive first round for Mercer. Bernard landing, connecting on only uh, nine punches. And that opening round, this is round two as Mercer just caught Bernard and staggered him. He's about to go down or be stopped. And the uh, referee calling a standing eight, Dennis Bradley providing a second standing eight. Three knockdowns in one round, a four in the bout. The match is over, and that includes standing eight. This one will be called is thrown in from the Canadian corner. It's all over. Ray Mercer stopping Wayne Bernard. It will be scored as RSC. The referee stops the contest. RSCM should be merciful because <laughs> he was getting clobbered by Mercer. It kind of is unfair. This kid just took it uh, in the last minute and he was... Uh, just had six bouts, so he gave it a good shot. The Canadian did. Uh, uh, Wayne Bernard uh, came in here with, on the last minute, and he's fighting one of the top guys in the United States team. So he did as well as could be expected, and the referee did a wonderful job. The end shows without any question he was getting hammered, and that didn't need to be. The official time, 42 seconds of the second round. 27-year-old Ray Mercer. The United States Army champion, a man who began boxing late in his career, only five years ago, and had an easy time with uh, Wayne Bernard, a substitute for the uh, Canadian heavyweight Tom Lesby. And now we're set. Ray Mercer alongside Wally Matthews. Ray, you're in there tonight with a fighter who had nothing to lose. He's not going to Seoul. He's a last-minute substitute. He's re his really only chance was to knock you out early. I must question the wisdom of getting into a slugfest with a guy like that. Well, there's no problem as long as uh, I know how to keep my hands up on the inside. And I figured he was throwing well. He's going to get caught sooner or later. Somebody's going to get caught, but it was more likely that he get caught, and he did. So. Well, that brings up another question. Two of your teammates, Andrew Maynard and Todd Foster, aggravated hand injuries fighting tonight. It makes you wonder about whether it's worth it for the team to fight this close to the Olympics. Well, we figured as far as the team, as uh, all the members on the boxing team, that um, this fight really, it wasn't really meant to be. You know, it's just a thing for the public, for the press, and everything. We're just going in and do our best. And we're supposed to be ready to fight for our country at any time, any time they call on us. And that's what we're doing. And we try to do it the best of our ability. Ray Mercer, thanks very much. And now back to Marv. All right. Thanks, Wally, and for the United States Olympic boxing team, a solid showing against the Canadian Olympic squad, winning eight out of the ten bouts. We'll be back to wrap it. Back in Charlotte, Marv Albert with the fight doctor, Ferdy Pacheco and Wally Matthews. And Ferdy, looking back uh, at the day from the United States' point of view, they did not go up against one of the stronger Olympic contingents in the Canadian Olympic team, but uh, certainly the coaches have to be pleased with what they saw. Yeah, I think this is the last hurdle before they do it for real. A team is coming together. You can feel it coalescing into a unit. Some learn painful lessons, like Kelsey Banks. You can't phone it in. you got to go in there and give 100%. But most of the uh, young men fought very hard, and I I think the feeling of unity is there and that's what the coaches wanted and five weeks from today they will be doing it for real in the ring in seoul and we'll be there to bring it